Hi there, welcome back. Today we're going to be going over a neurologic exam as well as the NIH stroke scale. This is something we use often in the emergency department. So we have our patient here today and we're going to go through a series of questions as if they were coming in with concerns for a stroke. So we'll get started now. Now, the first thing that we need to do for this patient is to determine their level of consciousness. Now, obviously, he is upright and seated and talking with us here, so we don't need to go too far into this. And we assign a scale for every patient on the NIH stroke scale. So next, we'll ask about the month that it currently is and the patient's age. Could you tell me what month it currently is? May. May, very good. And your age? 29. Great. So this patient answers both questions correctly and gets zero points. Next, we'll have the patient do some simple commands, such as blinking their eyes and grabbing my fingers. So would you mind please blinking your eyes? Great, and then squeeze my fingers. And I can also use that to evaluate the grip strength, which is five out of five for the muscle strength and equal bilaterally. Next, we'll check for any type of gaze palsy, which is checking of the visual fields. So you're probably familiar with this test. We'll get started here. I'll have you look straight ahead. Follow the tip of my finger, please. Good, and we're just looking for things like nystagmus here, which I don't notice any, and the gaze tracks evenly across midline in both eyes. And then of course we can test while we're here, superior, inferior, and again on the right side for the patient, and then accommodation. So our patient has no difficulty with any of those, tracks appropriately across midline, and we'd be able to identify a nerve palsy in a patient if the eye did not track past midline or was not able to go lateral. Next up is the questions or exam for facial palsy. A facial palsy is a deficit to the facial muscles where you'd see droop. So this is when we say we're analyzing uh, for a stroke for facial droop. This is one of the more complex ways to look at that. So we'll ask our patient to do a couple commands involving the facial muscles. Would you mind raising your eyebrows for me? Great, could you puff your cheeks out? And hold them, don't let me push them in. And this tests the strength here as well, great. And you can have the patient close your eyes very tightly. Tight, 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 and now I'm gonna try and open them. Great, okay, and we're not able to open the eyes, we're not able to compress the cheeks without undue force, and so that again is zero points, it's a normal exam. Next we'll evaluate for drift in the upper extremities here, so if you could please put your arms out in front of you with your palms up, and what I'll have you do is just close your eyes. Great, and just keep it like that, and we'll count to 10. So 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Great, and if you don't mind, put your hands back up for one moment. We're just gonna cover what we're looking for here. So we wanna see symmetry here, but we also are looking for a fine pronation of the hand. That would be a positive uh, left-sided pronator drift, and it can be more pronounced or it can be quite subtle. So that's something that we're looking for in this exam. Now the next thing we're gonna do um, is move on down to the lower extremities and repeat. Now while we count 10 seconds in the upper extremities, it's actually only five seconds in the lower extremities. Now for this, normally the patient would be recumbent in a ER bed at this point, but obviously for demonstration purposes, we're seated here. So I'm gonna have the patient lay down, if you don't mind, with your feet over here. And we'll come over to the side. And we'll get ready for this component of our exam. So first I'll have you lift this leg up for me. And hold it, five, four, three, two, one. Great, you can relax. Now we'll do the other side. Five, four, three, two, one. Very good. So you can see there's no drift or drop in strength. Both legs are able to lift and maintain their position equally. With our patient back and seated, because we don't have a bed that can Recline slightly here. We're going to do our limb ataxia testing. Ataxia is a problem with balance or the cerebellum usually. And so we'll start with finger nose finger testing. This is a very useful test to know. So what we'll have, the, have us do here is have the uh, patient put your finger on your nose for me and then use that finger to touch my finger. Go back to your nose, please. And out to my finger. And back to your nose, out to my finger. Great. And then we'll kind of switch sides here so you can see. And I'll have you put your left hand with the index finger towards my finger, out to your nose and to my finger, back to your nose and to my finger. Great. So you can see this is a normal test. The patient has no trouble. Now we're gonna demonstrate here what a positive test could look like because this is something you might see. So I'll have the patient put their finger on their nose and now when they come out to my finger, they have difficulty aligning and often miss the finger. It can be dramatic like that or more subtle where there's trouble actually setting onto the finger itself. But this is an important test. 
If there's ever concern, though, we can add in something called a heel-to-shin test, and we'll demonstrate that right now. What we're going to have the patient do now is uh, take their heel and run it up and down their shin. So I'll have you do that now on this side. You can see nice and midline. They're able to track their heel down the shin. And then we'll repeat on the other side, please. Excellent. And you can see that here. This is a normal test. Uh, abnormal test here would again be difficulty in smooth tracking. So this would be an example here of an ataxic movement, having trouble locating and localizing onto the shin and having a smooth movement up and down. So you can see this is a positive. The next thing we'll do is assess the patient's speech. Now this is important, especially if there's family to get collateral because some folks don't have normal speech that we would normally encounter. They can have garbled speech from a previous stroke or other deficits. So it's important to get a baseline if you can. But in our case, we're going to be asking our patient to say, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. This is commonly used in EMS. Really, it's any amount of speech that will allow you to evaluate the quality and type of speech that they have. So you could repeat, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. So you can see the words are clearly enunciated and there's no garbled speech. You'd obviously expect to hear some slurring or difficulty enunciating if this were to be a positive test. And the next test is known as aphasia, or we're looking for the inability to recognize common items and produce speech. For this, you can use things that you have that are easily identifiable. So we'll start with my stethoscope, which is right here. We'll hold this up, and you just ask the patient, what is this? A stethoscope. Very good. What we can also do is get some other equipment. Now, our patient, thankfully, is medically oriented today. This likely wouldn't work for someone else, but we'll ask, what is this? reflex hammer. Great. And another item that I don't have on myself right now but is commonly used is to take out your pen or pencil and ask the patient what that would be as well. The last test is for extinction or inattention. This is somebody who's not recognizing one entire half of their body. So what we can do is make a threatening motion towards one side of their face and they should have some type of a reaction, a blink or moving their head away, something like that. So what we'll do for demonstration is come quickly towards and you can see our patient blinks here rapidly because there's a threat coming towards the face. It would be abnormal if I did that and the patient were to look away or be totally unaware of this happening. So if I was doing this and the patient has no idea, that could be a positive test. That is the NIH scale in its entirety and that can help us make a decision of who is or is not having a stroke. I personally like to go a bit more in depth and do a rapid neurologic exam as well while I'm examining the patient for the first time. So we'll do that right now. That's going to include some strength testing, sensation testing, and reflexes. Next up we need to test for sensation. We're going to use sharp, which is the back of a reflex hammer, and then dull or light, which is just a cotton swab. So we'll do that in the upper and lower extremities for our patient and make sure that the sensation is preserved. Make sure to have your patient close their eyes for this. If you could please close your eyes and let me know where I'm touching and if it's sharp or dull. Uh, right and it's sharp. Good. Uh, left Left and it's sharp. Right uh, and it's uh, dull. Uh, right leg and it's sharp. Right leg and it's dull. Left leg and it's sharp. Left leg and it's dull. Very good. So you can see the patient was able to <coughs> both distinguish the location, but also whether it was a sharp or dull sensation. Now for the remainder of this neuro exam, it's not a complete exam, but it gives you an idea if there's any other deficits before this patient may go off for further imaging or tests. So what I like to do is have the patient grab my fingers and go through a range of motion for strength testing. Please grab my fingers and pull towards you. Push away. Good. Take your hands out to the sides of the room and pull in towards you. Great. And so what we've tested there is flexion and extension at the shoulder, abduction and adduction at the shoulder. Um, and then what we need to do is flexion and extension of the elbow, so we'll do that next, and normally we wouldn't stop in between. So again, holding my fingers, can you pull your hands towards your chest and push them away? Great, and so now we've tested all of the motions in the upper extremity, and we also have an idea of the strength of the wrist as well, because it takes some level of strength to do those movements while holding the hands. Now we'll do the same in the lower extremity. For this, I like to have the patient lying down, so if you don't mind. We'll start here at the hip. Now this is important in the leg to make sure you're isolating the right muscles. So what I'll have you do is by placing the hand just above the knee and a hand on the hip, can you please lift your leg up towards the ceiling? Good, and so we can test our muscle strength here at the hip. And then we'll just come underneath the hip. Please push your leg down towards the bed. 
Good. And there's good strength here. I always compare side to side. Can you lift your leg up? Good. And then push down? Good. Okay. So we have good strength at the hips. Um, what we'll have you do is press your leg out against my hand. Good. And then pull in. Good. So we have abduction and adduction of the left leg and then out towards the wall. Good. And in. Great. So we have equal strength. It's five out of five uh, bilaterally. And remember, we grade strength on a scale of one through five, depending on how strong that is and its resistance to gravity or ability to move. Next, I'll bend the leg up a bit and I'll have the patient kick their leg out. Good. And then pull back towards their bottom. Good. And then we'll compare on the other side. We'll stand the leg up here and kick out for me. Good, and pull back. Excellent. And now we'll check on the feet. I like to do these at the same time. If you could lay, lay your legs back down for me. And just pull up on my hands. Good, and push down like it's the gas. Very good. And we can see it's an equal five out of five strength in the entire of the lower extremities. During this, we can also ask the patient about sensation if there were any areas that we missed during our initial assessment. One of the last components that can be very helpful is evaluating the reflexes. Now the reflexes are generated by a quick response from the spinal cord due to an overstretching of the muscular tendon to try and protect the muscle. So that's what we're evaluating here to make sure that that reflex works appropriately. Now we'll go ahead and locate the patellar tendon here. And you can either do this over your finger or directly over the patient's tendon and we'll just have them relax. And you can see a small movement here. But if we want to see something more strong or pronounced, because this can be difficult to elicit in the emergency department, we do what's called distraction. Have the patient grasp their hands and pull apart as hard as you can. And you can see it's a much stronger response here. And that is due to the distraction. Reflexes can also be quantified, but for our purposes in this rapid exam, we just want to identify that they're present. We'll check over here as well, locate the tendon, and strike with the hammer, and we can see movement even without distraction. I hope that you enjoyed today's video. It was a bit different talking about a neurologic exam, so please be sure to give it a thumbs up and click on that subscribe so you can continue to learn and enjoy with us here. Let us know in the comments what you'd like to see in the next video. We'll see you next week.